If you've ever gone snorkeling or diving, you've probably leafed through a book that had pictures of fish along with their names. It's only natural to get out of the water and want to talk with your friends and dive buddies about what you saw. Having a shared vocabulary allows us to effectively communicate with each other. The names that most people start learning when they take an interest in fish are called common names. There are names like the orange band surgeon fish or the spotted box fish. Often they reflect some description of how a fish looks, like in the case of the blue spine unicorn fish. But the problem with using common names is that they're not standardized. Depending on where in the world you are and what book you might be using for a reference, the names can change. The rock mover wrasse, for example, gets its name from its habit of picking up rocks and tossing them about as it searches for prey. But in some books, this fish is known as a dragon wrasse, and it gets that name from the juvenile of the species that looks quite different. Scientists have attacked the problem of non-standardized names by using a system first developed in 1753 by a botanist named Carl Linnaeus. In the system that Linnaeus developed, he gave every type of organism a two-part name consisting of a genus and a species. And scientists still use this system known as binomial nomenclature. And with special rules that govern the system, it ensures that every living thing on the planet has a unique name that's the same no matter where in the world it's being studied. The convention used for writing the names of animal species also includes the name of the author who first described the species along with the year that he made that description. It's important to include this information because priority is given to the first name that a species was given in the scientific literature. Scientific names are sometimes called Latin names and quite often they're hard to pronounce. Take nasal literatus, for example, or Tanaketus strigosus. A third type of name exists when you consider the local human populations that live in island and coastal areas. Many of these cultures have been fishing for hundreds and even thousands of years. With that amount of time spent on an island fishing and observing fish, you can bet that an amazing library of knowledge has accrued through the years. For many island cultures, the naming system that is used to describe fish is deeply ingrained in the culture. The naming system often reflects the varying levels of value ascribed to different fish based on their value as food fish species. For example, in Hawaiian language, butterfly fish are not an especially sought after food fish group. And the name Kika Kapu is used for no less than eight different species of butterfly fish. This is in stark contrast with fish that are a major part of the food supply who might have more than one name for a single species based on the stage of growth that they're at. Goatfish are an interesting case. There are adult species known as Veke A and Veke Ula, and as juveniles, these species and two other Veke species are all known as Owama. It's common in Hawaiian fish names for there to be a general name for a fish family. Humuhumu, for example, is the general term for triggerfish. But going deeper into the Humuhumu, there are specific species known as Humuhumu ele ele, Humuhumu le, and of course everybody's favorite Hawaiian fish, Humuhumu nuku nuku apua'a. 